Amen. Galatians chapter 6. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 6 this morning. It's a great book of the Bible. And Paul talks to the Galatians about having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the works of the flesh? There's a lot of salvation instruction in the book of Galatians. We are not saved by what we do. We are saved by receiving what Jesus did on the cross. And so Paul deals with them about this. Um, and we come to chapter 6. Again, it's, it's all so rich. We'll just read a couple verses and see what the Lord has for us today. Chapter 6 and verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. And we're going to concentrate on the first verse, powerful verse, one that will help us in our Christian walk and help us to be a blessing to others. But let's ask the Lord's blessing. Father, thank you again for your word. I pray that you would just guide us through it now. May the Holy Spirit of God make this word powerful in our hearts and be glorified in all that takes place today. In Jesus' name, amen. It's probably a verse <clears throat> many people have committed to memory. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault. And I thought about that word fault. I looked it up and it means failing, neglect of duty, and offense, but it implies something wrong. A fault is something you didn't do right, I guess. Uh, it's easy to find fault. Amen? And it's hard to confess faults. Uh, and I, I won't expound on that or, or make that more uh, prevalent than I need to today. In James chapter 5 and verse 16, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. And then the next verse, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Confess your faults one to another, love one another that ye might be healed. That's an important part of the scripture. And, uh, you know, they say if, if they're going to arrest you, they're going to read you their, the rights, your rights. You know, all that you say or do can and will be used against you in a court of law. And sometimes you confess your faults to somebody and they use it in a court of law. That's why there's not a lot of that going on. <clears throat> but isn't it a blessing if you have a safe person in your life where you can talk about the things you're struggling with, the faults that you have. We all have them. I had a fault once back in 1984 and got rid of it, but uh, we all have them, and you could, we could have testimonies right now, and you could probably name a lot of my faults because I'm very visible, amen? And uh, I could probably think, well, I probably couldn't think of any faults that you have, so I'm a really nice guy, amen? It doesn't mean anything about being a nice guy. Paul said, am I your enemy because I tell you the truth. The truth is important. And so he wanted to show them the error of their way. But anyway, think of that. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. We should desire other people's prayers for us that might help us to be better Christians. In Matthew chapter 18, you don't have to turn there, just let me read one verse. It says in verse 15, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee. We, God forgives our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But it says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. So when, when there's an issue and you need to expose something, you go to that person yourself. You don't get another person involved in it and share with them what's going wrong with the brother or sister. You go to them. And hopefully it's received and you work it out. Amen? And then there's restoration. And that's where we go into the rest of our, our text here. If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual. Boy, that's a good subject too. And uh, we're going to look at that a little bit. You know, we're born of the Spirit. We're born again of the Spirit. 
So we have salvation, we have a new nature, Christ dwells within us, but that's all the work of the Spirit. And if we were to divine, de define spirituality, that's a hard thing to define in a sentence. Uh, so we're going to go through that a little bit today because this is the help that we need. True religion, not a form, but something that's real in the heart. James chapter 1 and verse 27 Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. Here's the definition. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. If any man, the verse before that, if any man seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, this man's religion is in vain or vain. And it's empty. There's really not a lot to it. So God in those two verses really gives us something to think about. It's pure religion. Uh, somebody said spirituality is having holy affections, something in your heart that you desire. Out of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Out of the heart are the issues of life. Love the Lord with all your heart. All the verses about the heart. So it's something that's inward, not just outward. It's not something we do. It's something that we are because it's God that worketh in us both to will and do of his good pleasure. There's a change inside of us. We're partakers, again, of that divine nature. Spirituality would be described maybe as being like Christ. He delighteth in mercy. Not my will, but thy will be done. And you can go down a, a host of verses there. Um, 1 John 4.11 says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. It's mutual. And it's a blessing to do that. Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So that's true spirituality. True spirituality is our relationship with God that helps us have a relationship with man. The greatest commandment is love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind. The second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So God does something for us, something spiritual in our hearts, and then we allow that, we work out that salvation, and we touch other people's lives. True spirituality. We visit, we help, we pray for those that are in need. Uh, in Romans chapter 15 and verse 1, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. So, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual. See, God puts that in that order. We see the need, but then we have to respond in a spiritual way, and we can only do that if we, we are spiritual. Amen? If we have that spirit filling us and directing us and using us. In um, Ephesians 6.10, I'll be done with this introduction in a minute. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. This isn't a physical strength. This is a spiritual strength. 2 Corinthians 12.10. Therefore, Paul said, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. So he's showing all the circumstantial things and the physical things that's not where our strength needs to come from to help people. Uh, you may be very weak in the flesh. You may be going through the trial of your life, but you can be a blessing to somebody if you're strong in the Lord, if you have God working in your heart and in your life. Spiritual people are dependent upon the Lord because we can't do this on our own. Spiritual people are humble because they take God's instruction. I think I brought out last week, you have the truth. The truth brings order and order brings peace. Amen? But it all starts with the truth. And so that's truth in the inward parts that God uses in our life. In our text, ye which are spiritual. Listen to some of these. This isn't a complete list, but the fruit of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit, the leading of the Spirit, the filling of the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit, singing in the Spirit. If any man worship me, let him worship in spirit and and truth. I think I misquoted that. But oh, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And all of the verses where the Holy Spirit is the comforter, the Holy Spirit is our guide, all of that. So to do a spiritual work, 
we need the Holy Spirit working in us. To do that, we need to be weak in our own will and strong in his will, strong in the power of his might. Now, the whole verse, here's the whole verse. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. We can help each other, and here's the thing, considering thyself, because one day we're going to need help. Amen? And so it works like that, where we need people praying for us. Philippians 2, 3, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Ephesians 4, 2, with all lowliness of mind, with long-suffering, forbearing one another. So we suffer long. We're long-suffering with somebody else's faults. Amen? We might get irritated. You ever get irritated with somebody's faults? Probably not, but you probably know somebody who has, you know? The irritation, the frustration, the criticism. If you, if you were better than what you are, that wouldn't be so hard on me, right? And that's usually the way it goes. It's easier to find fault than to confess fault. And the problem arises when we don't see anything in ourselves or we don't consider ourselves. And that's what God is saying. But if we see someone overtaken in a fault, whatever degree that is, there's biblical instruction for how to be a blessing. It says, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. And all of these things, all of these truths, that's how we can help somebody. 1 Thessalonians 5.14. Now we exhort you, brethren... Warn them that are unruly. We don't rub somebody's face in it. We warn them. We want them to be whole. We want them to be a blessing. It says, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. Comfort, support, be patient. Again, there's more instruction. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We will look at a few verses there. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 10, it talks about the, uh, the, those that despise the day of small things. And small, not in the sense of tiny, but in maybe weak things. But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and let's begin reading in verse, oh, verse 26. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many, it doesn't say not any, it says, not many wise men after the flesh, <clears throat> not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence." But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. God hath chosen us. He hath chosen us. Not because of our merit, not because of our intellect, although he can, but sometimes the weak vessel is used in a way we, it just blows our mind. Because how could God do that? We have the story of the uh, the parable of the moat and the beam, I brought that out last week. And if you see a moat in your brother's eye, he says, get the beam out of your own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly. And it's just a picture of being spiritual. Then thou shalt see clearly to take the moat out of thy brother's eye. Remember the Pharisee and the publican. The Pharisee said, I thank God I'm not like this guy. And the weak one came before the Lord and said, Lord, have mercy on me. And he went home justified. But the Pharisee, who was high and mighty and thought more of himself than he ought to think, he didn't help anybody. He didn't even help himself. And he certainly didn't help the publican. In Isaiah 65 and verse 5, God says, which say, stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou these are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all day. That's how God describes that type of an attitude. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall, considering thyself. 
In John 15, without him we can do nothing. In Philippians chapter 4, with him we can do all things. The Bible says with God all things are possible, but with man they're impossible. So God has to do it. Amen? It's a spiritual work. You can't do a spiritual work. The Spirit of God has to do that work. And if we grieve or quench the Spirit, He doesn't do the work. But if we're filled with the Spirit, if we walk in the Spirit, all those truths, then it's God that worketh in us and out of us too. Small things. Shamgar had an ox goad. David had a sling. Dorcas had a needle. Rahab had some string. Samson had a jawbone. Moses had a rod. Mary had some ointment, but they were all used of God. Just some little thing. Think of the 12 disciples. This, this is the message today. The 12 disciples. Boy, were they a mess. You say, they were? Yeah, you just read about them. They were always debating who should be more important, right? They were always fighting about who's more important, who should be the greatest. Um, there was a time when they all forsook him and fled. There was a time where Jesus said, how is it that you have no faith? Look, you've followed me around. You've seen these miracles. Why don't you believe me now in this new problem that's arising? God chose those, and he, one was even a devil, but God chose those. John 15, 16. I have not, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That's what he says. I've chosen you. Who did he choose? We're going to look at that in a minute. But these guys, these guys had trouble. They had problems. Amen? I think what God is interested in is molding and making us and conforming us to his likeness. And when we're filled with the Spirit, that's what takes place. The Bible says, uh, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise, that your fruit should remain. God saves us, and, and we're saved from all different walks of life, all different personalities, all different attitudes, so that we can reach people that we have been freed from those bondages. We have Gideon in the Bible. Gideon was a mess. I don't know if you know the story. Uh, we go back to the book of Judges. Remember the Judges cycle? Six times. Sin, servitude, supplication, salvation. So the nation of Israel sinned. They were put in bondage to another nation. Servitude. They prayed, supplication, and God sent somebody to deliver them. Uh, he freed them from that bondage. Sin, servitude, supplication, salvation. So here's Gideon. Uh, the nation is being oppressed and ruled by the Midianites. And uh, God sends an angel and he comes before Gideon and he says, Gideon, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon says, who? You know, Gideon was hiding as were most people. They were hiding from the enemy. And God says, I am going to use you to free these people. <clears throat> and he was such a fearful man. Uh, in Judges chapter 15, he said unto him, O oh my Lord, Wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. But God said, Have not I sent thee? I sent thee. And here's, here's two verses. <clears throat> it says in Judges 6, 34, But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, this fearful man. And you know the story. Gideon's 300, right? And so he defeated all the Midianites without fire and a shot. God did all of that because the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. It says in Judges 7, 18, when they were getting ready to fight the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So it's God's power that did that. We are not going to accomplish anything through the works of the flesh. You just accomplish the works of the flesh. What we accomplish spiritually is through the power of the Spirit. We have John Mark. John Mark was a mess. He had a good heart. He went with Paul, the apostle, on the first missionary journey. Paul and Barnabas were there. Barnabas uh, took John Mark. And there were a lot of trials on that first missionary journey. And so many that John Mark went back. And he quit. He just quit. We come to Acts chapter 15. I don't know if you want to turn there. I will read a few verses there. They're going to go on another missionary journey. And 
Barnabas wants to take John Mark again. Now remember, he quit. He left the missionary endeavor. And Paul says, no, I don't think we ought to take him. Here's the story. Verse 36, some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. That's the same one that just quit. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, uh, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from another. Only by pride cometh contention. These are two great Christians. But here was a fault, right? I mean, you can get proud and you can get stubborn in your own way. And sometimes you get over it. We'll see that they both did. But it says the contention was so sharp. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren under the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. One was determined and one thought not. An immovable object and an, what's the other one? Immovable object and an irresistible force. And they, they had contention because of this. Now, God used both of them even though there was a fault here. Amen? You ever have an argument with somebody? That doesn't mean you're never going to be friends again. Amen? It just means that somebody's at fault, amen? And maybe nobody's at fault. Maybe you just see it two different ways. But anyway, towards the end of Paul's life, remember, this was really a point of contention. But at the end of Paul's life, 2 Timothy 4.11, Paul's getting ready to die, be put to death. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Thank God for Barnabas, Amen. Barnabas was tremendous in getting John Mark straightened out. Maybe Paul was too hard on him. And there's all kinds of suppositions there. Sometimes God will use the most unlikely instrument. But if it's God, it's God. Joe Henry Hankin said, God can hit an awful hard lick with a crooked stick if the stick belongs to him. Amen? But Peter... A rugged fisherman, headstrong, denied the Lord three times. Oh, he's a good choice. You know, yeah, well, he's a good choice. He doesn't work well with people. He's got too many of his own opinions. Uh, he's, I mean, he opens his mouth and says some of the dumbest things you ever heard in your life. Oh, he, yeah, he's a good choice. We wouldn't have chose Peter. Amen? But God chose him because God knew what Peter was going to become. He knew that. He said, when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. And he said, I will be with thee. That's a blessing. James and John, their nickname was the Sons of Thunder. Uh, here's, here's some people, and they rejected Christ from the city. And James and John said, call down fire from heaven like Elijah and just nuke them. Just burn them up. Just destroy them. And the Lord said, I didn't come to do that. I came to save men's lives. Amen. Sons of thunder. Later, John became the beloved disciple. Amen? Uh, you have Philip. Uh, Jesus is getting ready to feed thousands of people, and Philip comes up and says, man, 200 penny worth wouldn't be enough. What in the world are you talking about? He was real analytical, and he had an analytical brain, which can be used wonderfully for the Lord, but it can be used against that too. Oh, I think this is the only way to do it. And the Lord said, watch, Philip. And then later in John chapter 14, Philip said, show us the Father, show us the Father. And the Lord says, have I been so long time with you, Philip? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he just didn't get it. But later on, he was certainly a blessing. Amen? Sometimes we're, we analyze too much. Thomas, I don't know if you knew this about Thomas, but that is not Thomas's first name. That's his last name. His first name is Doubting. And uh, that's the tag everybody gives him, Doubting Thomas. He said, unless I see, unless I see. But you know, it was a blessing. He wanted it to be real. Amen? And God used him. Uh, we have Matthew, the tax collector. 
There was nobody more despised than a tax collector taking taxes from the Jews at that time. Nobody more despised, but God chose him, not caring what anybody else thought, only caring what I can do in that man's life and transforming him. And if he's transformed, think of the people that are going to see that and go, wow, like Zacchaeus coming down. Amen? And Zacchaeus got saved that day, the song says. Uh, not many mighty. We just looked at that list, but it doesn't say not any mighty. I won't go on very long, but Luke was the beloved physician. Barnabas, his, his name meant son of consolation, and he certainly was. Andrew, Andrew first findeth his brother Simon, Simon Peter, and says, we found the Christ. What a blessing. The apostle Paul, such a brilliant, brilliant man such a, a, a strong constitution for the Lord. He'd given his life, but a brilliant man used to write most of the New Testament. Not many, but certainly some. And God chose Paul, and we have the scriptures over and over that prove that. All God needs to do a spiritual work is us to let the Spirit of God control our life. Just a surrender to God working in our life. Uh, there's an Old Testament story about Samson, and Samson uh, met Delilah, and that, that sure didn't help him any, but Samson was used by the Spirit of God to do a lot of things. It says the Spirit of God came upon Samson, and he did this. The Spirit of God came upon Samson, and he did this. Well, remember how she deceived him, and uh, he needed a haircut? He didn't need a haircut. Well, you know the story. But anyway, this is what she says. She said, Samson, the Philistines be upon thee. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself. And he wished not that the Lord was departed from him. His strength was gone. And he didn't have anything to use against the enemy. And you know how he died. Uh, it was in shame. It was embarrassing. But then at the very last minute, God gave him the strength again, and he defeated the enemy. But it was because he didn't know the spirit had departed from him. You ever get in a routine? Okay, I got to work, or I got to do this, and this is what I do on Monday, and this is what I do on Tuesday. I know it's Sunday. It's 930. I get here about 9 o'clock. I get here about uh, 929, you know, whatever you want whatever you do, and, uh, but, but you're here, and, you know, you listen to the service, stand up, sit down, sing another song, stand up, yeah, okay, do this, do that, eat donuts, go home, drink the coffee. We get in, a, in this, you know, and a rut, yeah, a routine and a rut, and, and I'm telling you, it's with all of us, Without that desire to be filled with that spirit and to that word of God, which is a spiritual word, cleanse us and help us, we can get in a routine. And when the enemy comes, we get up as before, and it just doesn't help us. We don't have God's strength. And God needs us to have his strength because God needs to use us in his way. One last thing to point out, Psalm 16:5. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen to me in pleasant places. God's called us. God's put us in a place to work for him, for his honor and for his glory. 2 Corinthians 5.18, All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. This is what our life is about. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one. It's that ministry of restoring people, ye which are spiritual. There's a story back in the Old Testament about David, and David is running away from Saul. Saul wanted to kill him, and it's in uh, 1 Timothy or 1 Samuel chapter 30 that uh, I want to bring these points out, but. David sees with his men, uh, while he's out in a battle, he sees smoke from the city where his family is, all their wives and their children. It's Ziklag, and they see the smoke. So they come back, 
and uh, the enemy has taken everybody. And God says, what do we do? What do we do? And, and God says, go pursue and you'll overtake them and you'll be victorious and come back. So David has 600 men and 400 have the strength to go, but 200 are so faint and so weak that they cannot go. And so they just stay behind. David goes out, they fight the enemy, they win all of their loved ones back and they come back with the spoils. And there are a certain in the group of the 400 that say, don't share any of the spoils with the 200. They did not go with us. They don't deserve. They weren't in the battle. They don't deserve. They had been in the battle. Amen. They had followed David. They were very faithful. They were just too faint to do the work, to do the battle. And so this is what David said in verse 24. For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. They shall part alike. I just want to kind of close with this thought. Uh, we've been here for a while, and there are pictures of this person and that person, and I hear stories about how the church was started. And... Uh, we're not all spring chickens anymore. We're old hens, I guess, you know. But uh, we're not the spring chicken. But, but there are a lot of people. There are some people that can't even be here today because they're too faint. They're too weary. There are certain things that people can't do that they used to do. But they've been in the battle. Amen. And sometimes God changes how we fight the battle. Sometimes it's by prayer. Sometimes it's a word of encouragement. Sometimes it's a card. Sometimes, whatever it is, sometimes it can't be something physical. I want you to know that God appreciates your service for the Lord. Amen? And God knows all about it. Paul said toward the end of his life, I've fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. That was all he could do now and as pray for people. I want to read a verse in Revelation because we're all going to be here someday. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. This is my point. We have three score and ten. Maybe by reason of strength there's four score, 80 years. Maybe it's more than that. Maybe it's a lot less than that. But one day, what we've done for Christ is really going to matter. Their works do follow them. There's a generation coming after us. I've never seen our, the world like it is today, especially I've not seen our country like it is today. Compared to the Scripture, there's a great falling away. And we need the light to shine brightly. Amen? And sometimes... People have left a wonderful testimony behind. Their works do follow them. I want to encourage you today. Keep serving the Lord. Amen. However you can. It might not be in a physical way, but certainly in a spiritual way. That testimony will follow all of us. A lot of work to do for the Lord. Amen. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, boy, the world's so crazy. Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, everybody. You know, I, I have found myself watching the news and getting angry, and God's convicted me. I don't need to be angry at the people. I need to be angry at the sin, because God loves those people. He died for them. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father, bless your word today. Oh, God, help us. Help us to be spiritual that we might know how to be an instrument for you.
we might know how to answer every man with the hope that's in us. I pray, God, that our spirit would be submitted to you, that you would be able to lead us and guide us and use us. Please, please help us. Bless our church, our people. Bless those that are home, that have been home for a while, that can't even make it to church as they listen to this message. May God, they be encouraged by it. Help us to love one another and to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.